Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Jim McGreevy from the Beer Institute, and I'm happy to welcome you back to the fifth installment of the You Ought to Know a Beer Industry Employee. Uh, thanks to so many of you for uh, coming back uh, to hear more about the different stories and careers of uh, folks in the beer business, uh, a business that is a $330 billion economic contributor to, uh, contributor to the country. Uh, 2.1 million Americans owe their livelihoods in one way or another to the production, distribution, and sale of beer. And we have one of those great Americans with us today. Say hello to Kim Murata. Kim is the Senior Director of Sustainability and Enterprise Risk Management at the Molson Coors Company. Welcome, Kim. Hey, good to see you, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. Good to see you. And you, um, you come from us live from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Tell us about where you are right now. Yeah, I am in really this awesome pub. We call it Fred's Pub or Fred Miller's Pub. Um, and it's right on the heart of the Milwaukee campus on our first floor. And one of the great things about working in the beer industry is that when it's not coronavirus, this pub is open every day for uh, employees and visitors and it gets packed, it gets crowded. It's a great place to congregate and great place to be here today. And who is Fred? Fred Miller. So Fred is a founder of Miller Brewing Company. Um, and Miller Brewing Company and Coors Brewing Company um, and Molson Coors Brewing Company have come together to form Molson Coors. So we have these types of pubs in variety of campuses. We have the Adolf Coors Pub in Colorado, and then we certainly have the Molson Coors Pubs up in Canada. But you can find that type of history and heritage almost in any uh, office or any of our locations. Well, you're, you're certainly right about uh, beer bringing folks together, even employees inside the company. We have we have a, a bar here at the Beer Institute in Washington, D.C. that we, we like to use a lot of. Some of our viewers have been to our bar, and we, uh, would, we will welcome you back when the time is right uh, later on in 2021. But it is a great aspect of the beer business that uh, employees and, and consumers and beer lovers can enjoy, this, uh, this ability to get together and have a... Uh, have conversations and camaraderie over beer. It's it's wonderful, and you've been in uh, you've been working in Wisconsin at Miller for a number of years. I think you have a great personal story, and I'd love to start there. You're a native Wisconsinite. I am. I'm a native. I grew up in Kenosha, Wisconsin, so just above the Illinois or and Wisconsin border. I went to undergraduate at Marquette University, which is literally about five blocks away from our Milwaukee campus. So I get to drive through almost every single day. And then I went to law school up in Madison. So that little trifecta of the Southeastern and then Madison is where I've grown up and been most of my life. And uh, not only do you have a great career over a number of years at, at Miller Coors and now Molson Coors, but your, your, your connection to Wisconsin politics, Wisconsin sports is, is, uh, is all encompassing. Um, uh, tell us just a little bit about your uh, family's history with Marquette University. Sure. Um, so Jim and I, for those of you who probably don't know, we have a little bit of a Big East rivalry, but uh, Marquette University is one of those programs and one of those schools that's really just part of our DNA. I am a Marquette University graduate, um, and almost everyone in my family has stepped foot on the Marquette University campus. Um, my grandfather actually was on the basketball team when he was at Marquette. My father uh, played on the basketball team when he was at Marquette. My late husband played on the basketball team when he was at Marquette. And now it's really awesome because my son played four years for Marquette and is now on the coaching staff. And my daughter is a junior on the Marquette women's basketball team. So while a lot of people might bleed beer in the beer business, I think we bleed a little bit of blue and gold in our family. But that's our, our long connection to Milwaukee and, and to Marquette. We love this hometown, love this place, and uh, really are proud to be Marquette grads and part of the Milwaukee community. So when winter comes, you're um, you're not missing a, a men's or a women's basketball game at this point, it sounds like. No, and I was so happy to feel like we were a little bit normal where basketball actually got started and um, we could be together as a family, even though we're not in the gym watching it live, but watching games on TV, it feels good. It feels like a little bit of normalcy coming back into our lives during you know this pandemic. That's for sure. Well, at least right now, you're one of those lucky few as family that, uh, that might be able to attend a game. But, uh, you know, it seems like the uh, we're almost uh, uh, seeing the end in sight here on COVID. So we'll all be welcome back at basketball games and at 
bars and restaurants all over the country, hopefully very soon. So, um, Kim, thank you very much for being here today. You have a very unique job. You've had a very unique career at Molson Coors over uh, the last few years. Um, and your job now as Senior Director of Sustainability and Risk, Ma risk uh, Enterprise Risk Management, uh, in your role, I understand you're fostering sustainability programs, which we're going to talk a lot about, managing risk in different ways, uh, financial risk, logistics risk. Um, uh, you have a segment of your job that's about enhancing your company's rep uh, reputation and uh, creating synergy and achieving short-term and long-term growth goals. So that sounds like nearly you're touching nearly everything that happens at Molson Coors. Could you just give us a little uh, sort of synopsis of your day and, and what all of that entails before we sort of dive into particularly some of the sustainability work you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my role, and really quite candidly, I feel like I have one of the best jobs that you possibly can have. I mean, certainly being part of an industry like the beer and the beverage industry is so exciting. But then being able to literally, just like you said, touch almost every aspect of the business. Because when you look at sustainability, it's how we talk to our consumers through our brands, how we talk to our investors about our company and, how, and, and our investments in our business, how we address you know, natural resources, um, whether it's water or plastics or carbon emissions, um, how we show that we're a responsible citizen through our alcohol responsibility programs. And then certainly last but definitely not least, how we invest in our people because putting people first is really the heart of our business and you know really making strong commitments to diversity and inclusion safety and our people is really important so that's a quick way to say that i'm going to be here for a long time so if any of you guys are thinking about applying i'm hoping i'll be here but it's really a great job and a great opportunity i feel it's quite the privilege well certainly there's no uh, more important piece to the business at this moment uh, during this uh, public health crisis and economic crisis than the people of your company. Um, uh, you've, you've got folks across the country now, uh, across the world, um, and they are engaged in all different aspects of the business, but you're, you're, you, you guys at Molson Coors and so many others in the beer business are putting a particular emphasis on sustainability. Um, and that, that really runs across the gamut of resources and people and, um, and, um, and how you go to market every day and how you present yourselves to consumers. It does. I mean, it's so, it's just so important and it's amazing how much it touches, you know, whether when you just look at this, you know, the packaging, just in a beer, you can look at it from the liquid. So how, what, the, what are the ingredients that are going in here? But who are the farmers that we worked with to actually help produce this product? What was the ground and the soil and the conditions that they used to actually plant the barley all the way through the brewing process to how's the consumer receive it? And what do they do with it? You know, when they're done with it, how do they recycle it? And how do we make sure that it creates a positive imprint? So it's it's exciting when you think about sustainability in all those aspects, and yet you know, and all the opportunities to make a positive imprint and a positive impact on the world. So you have all those different um, uh, things that you're doing around sustainability. Um, that, that there are probably many annual and uh, longer term goals that uh, that you have, but um, you, you put all of this into a report every year. Uh, called the, the Our Impact Report. Could you talk a little bit about um, how that comes together? Um, you know what it what it talks about and how you use it to communicate with shareholders, consumers, the general public. How important is that Our Impact Report to um, what your company is doing? Absolutely. And actually, sorry, it's, Jim, it's just our imprint, um, which same imprint. idea, but it is about our impact. And um, the reason we call it our imprint is that we wanted to you know, be a little bit different. Certainly when you talk about sustainability, so many companies are looking at it. So it's the imprint. So every time you pick up a beer, there's an imprint left behind and we wanna make sure that it's a positive one. So it's the imprint that we leave on our communities where we have our businesses and where we're located and where our people are living and working. It's imprint we leave on our environment and it's an imprint we leave on just general economy and our stakeholders. And a great way for us to share that communication is through a report. Um, and we spend a lot of time because one of the things that we've learned 
is many of our key stakeholder groups read that report and really uh, pay attention to what's in there. So if you're a new employee and you're deciding, you know, where am I going to work? Is this the company that's going to be the right fit to me? You're going to go to a website and most likely you're going to look at information there and our imprint reports that give you the key facts and the figures. Or if you're an investor and you're making a decision, is this the type of company I want to invest in? Is this a company that is managing its resources effectively? We hear from them, they go to our imprint reports and to our websites and to public information. And that's how so many you know, um, groups like that gain information about us. And hopefully, you know, those that joined us in this webinar, you might have also, through our government affairs teams or through other you know, possibilities, see, have seen our reports through the years. So you can see those facts and figures and the stories and the people behind them and really give you a flavor also for what our business is all about. So we're going to provide that our imprint, imprint report to, uh, to our, our viewers uh, later on uh, when, we, um, when we send out some additional information about this webinar. But the, the Our Imprint is a report of what you're doing and how it's going. Let's back up a little bit. And uh, I'd like to talk about what you see as the challenges around sustainability and the opportunities that a company, a global company, uh, iconic company like yours uh, has. What, what are the, some of the challenges that you all face in improving the environment, improving the water, and uh, improving the experience for your consumers? And for your employees yeah it's you know and i like how you phrase the question what when you look at it what are the challenges and then what are the opportunities because the very notion of sustainability is how do we make sure that we're sustainable for the long term and the long future or for or for the future so when we look at challenges you know right now right on us we're looking certainly head you know on a climate change so how does a company like ours address climate change? And what we've done from an opportunity standpoint is we set very aggressive greenhouse gas emission targets that over, I think, you know, a year and a half ago, were already approved by what's called the Science-Based Target Initiative. We were the first of 377 companies to actually have our targets approved. And not only do they align with the Paris Climate Agreement, to keep global warming below two degrees, but they're even more aggressive to keep it um, at 1.5 degrees. So a challenge and an opportunity. Plastics, another big challenge that we're facing, whether it's consumers or retailers or investors, or they just you know general care about the environment, how do we reduce that impact in our packaging and in our products? So those again, create real opportunities. How do we innovate? How do we bring in technology? How do we think differently? How do we you know, show really that we're bold and decisive and create really good change? And then, you know, again, another great um, challenge and yet an opportunity is when we look at the social justice movement, how do we really you know, embrace that as a company? How do we make a difference and invest in our communities and in causes that really can create substantial change and you know, really make this a great opportunity. So those are just three, but I could go on. But you know, part of my role is just that: looking at those challenges, looking at those risks, and making really good, wise decisions on behalf or encouraging the company to make those decisions. You know, uh, folks have a, uh, a fabulous pint of beer. They have a beer that tastes great in a in a bottle or in a can. Uh, you mentioned plastics. Could you just talk a little bit about? how the, the where did the plastics come in and and how is the sustainability approach to the to plastic because that's it's a huge issue in other consumer products groups um but you know beer you don't serve beer in plastic so where does it where does it fit into your supply chain yeah you're right we don't serve a ton of beer in plastics we have some of our product in some larger pet um, bottles, but when you think about it, it's also the six pack plastic rings or the 12 pack plastic rings. And then the shrink wrap that sometimes that you'll see at retail that holds like a 24 pack of cans together. So even though it's not, it's less than 5% of our volume by weight, it's still an issue that we need to tackle and really look at um, what we want to commit to. So we said 100% of all of our packaging will be recyclable, reusable and compostable. And then when we look at our plastics in particular, we will make sure to have at least 30% recycled content in our consumer facing plastics packaging. And then it's not just that easy. You can have plastics, you can have recycled content, but if it's not getting recycled, that's another issue. So we're committed to working globally and um, you know, 
federally and locally on recycling infra infrastructure and recycling solutions. Um, and then lastly, around plastics, they're a big component of our greenhouse gas emissions. They're actually the largest component. So we partner with our packaging suppliers as well um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and our overall carbon footprint. So as you say, a big part of the global um, uh, climate change uh, piece of the puzzle, obviously a small part of your uh, packaging mix, but still important to your company. Much bigger, uh, sort of probably much more concern to your company certainly is water and water sustainability. So, uh, you know, water is one of the primary ingredients uh, of beer, um, and you spend you must spend a lot of time thinking about the best way to use and uh, and um, uh, redistribute water. Could you talk a little bit about um, how the generally the way you look at water sustainability at your company, and then we can sort of dive into a few specifics? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So you kind of touched on it. We often just real clearly say no water, no beer. So for us, just like you said, it's the main ingredient in our products. It helps water our crops with our barley farmers. It's used throughout the brewing process. We heat it up, we cool it down. It's part of the pasteurizer. Um, so it's really critical to us that we have great um, high quality and quantity of water to brew our great beer. So when we look at it, it's three ways. What are we doing in our breweries? How do we make sure we're as efficient as possible when we're actually producing our beer? What are we doing in our brewery watersheds? In the United States, we have two breweries that are located in watersheds where water is scarce, where we have real issues of drought. So how do we collaboratively work within those watersheds to restore water or protect the water in those watersheds? And then third, how do we work with our barley farmers and our hops farmers to reduce the amount of water that they rely on as well to grow really great high quality barley and hops. So that's the three parts of our, of our uh, water stool. So growers, watersheds, and then what you're doing with the, with the water inside the breweries. And all of those go into sort of targets that you have. Uh, you have a 2025 targets um, that you're working on. Tell us a little bit, a little bit about those targets and how you attempt to achieve them. Absolutely. So we, um, back in 2016, when Molson Coors Beverage Company um, was formed, we became the, about the fifth largest brewer in the world. So it was really important for us to figure out what was, where do we want to focus and where do we really want to make the biggest impact? So we set targets in three, what we call pillars. So one around alcohol responsibility, one around the environment, and one, and one around people and communities. Those are our pillars. And so water is in our environmental area. And when we set the targets, we said we want to reduce the amount of water that we're using in our breweries. We actually set a target to reduce it by 22 percent. And, and we're on our way. That's about investing in our capital, investing in our people and making real changes about how we actually brew our beer. Um, the second target is about our watersheds. So we made a goal that we're going to restore water in our watersheds that are scarce or stressed and put back water into those watersheds. And then our third is reducing the water within agricultural supply chain. So our commitment is that we were going to reduce the amount of water that we use by 10% across our agricultural supply chain. Now you might think to yourself, oh, 10%, how big is that? Well, 90% of all the water that we use is actually within our agricultural supply chain. So if we reduce our water or when we reduce our water by 10%, that's actually 7.6 billion gallons of water. So we can make a real sizable um, impact and scale that up in our, you know, in our in our barley growing regions. Now I'm, I'm interested. Well, I'm interested in each of those um, those pieces of the puzzle, but uh, I'm interested particularly in the watershed. Uh, obviously, you're using water for a commercial purpose. Others uh, others are using it for various purposes, including homeowners. Um, let's talk a little bit about the watershed work that you do. Um, uh, there, there's some specific examples you said earlier. Two of your breweries are in particular particular watersheds that you put a particular emphasis on trying to restore water. T talk about that a little bit. Sure. And, it, and what's nice about it, the two that we can talk about as an example, kind of two different approaches that we've taken. So the first is in Texas. Um, and our brewery there is located in Fort Worth, and it's in the Trinity River watershed. That watershed actually supplies more than 45% of the amount of water needed for the state of Texas. So that's Houston and Dallas and Fort Worth, major metropolitan cities. And when you look at or when we've looked at 
um, the, the population growth and demand that's going to happen over the next 10, 20 years, the industry growth and demand, the agriculture growth and demand, there's not available enough available water for the long term. So what we did is probably actually more than about a decade ago, started a partnership and it really started with one rancher. He happened, he's, his ranch is about an hour and 45 minutes outside of our brewery, but he relies obviously also on the Trinity. And we brought in a nonprofit group as well as the federal government through the USDA and NRCS and the region, Tarrant Regional Water um, Municipality there. And collectively, we started to put in best management practices so that he could keep water on the ground and, um, and keep a good high quality water within those streams. We had such great success. This was Gary and Sue Price. I just need to call them out because they are such pivotal uh, members of our story. He's a National Cattleman Award winner and their commitment to the environment is just really far none. And because they have that high regard within their community or they're so highly regarded, other ranchers and farmers and landowners came to visit their ranch. And what might have started in 2010 with just the prices was up to about 10 um, farmers and ranchers and landowners in 2011, and then 15 and the like. And now that partnership has grown over the years. I think collectively we've spent over about $8 million um, with the federal government and ourselves and the municipality or you know, the water district. And we've restored over 2.1 billion gallons of water to the Trinity. And our goal is let's scale it up. So we just hosted a meeting just about two weeks ago and Coke, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and Dr. Pepper and NRG and, and other water users and foundations um, are, we're all figuring out how do we collectively work together so we really can create good impact and change. And then just real quickly on Golden. So Golden's also so important to us. And when we look at water stress, it's an issue, but also wildfires in that region are such an issue. So there we've partnered with the um, uh, Nature Conservancy and again, Pepsi-Cola and Wells Fargo, and we're doing reforestation efforts to really help control the danger of wildfires, which then in turn, help improve, in turn helps improve the quality of water in the Clear Creek. I want, I want to talk a little bit about the partnerships, uh, Kim, but um, you mentioned Golden and we have a question from Bob Sesto or comment, I guess, comment and question. And Bob says, I love Coors Banquet beer. It's my favorite. Just wondering if all the beers at the Golden Brewery get the Clear Creek water or is it just Coors Banquet? Good question. I shouldn't give away any little marketing uh, tidbits, but that brewery relies really heavily or, or on the Clear Creek and that water is integral to us. So it's across all the brands that we brew there. It's super important that we have really great high quality bot, uh, water, but that's the only place that Coors Banquet is brewed. Okay, so that's the only place that's brewed. Uh, that's, so that's good. So Clear Creek, uh, Clear Creek water all day for Bob and and lovers of banquet. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, so watershed's important. Uh, affects millions of people in in various parts of the country, as you said. Your Trinity watershed affects the livelihoods of uh, folks in Houston and Dallas, Fort Worth, and businesses and farmers and others. Um, but you talked about starting that watershed project with a brew uh, with a grower. So. Let's turn our attention to the grower piece of this. You said um, you were trying to get 10%, your target was 10%, I think you said less, less water use from growers. You have a, a, a grow best practice uh, uh, initiative that you work on. Talk about the importance of the growers to, beer, the, to the, the beer production and um, how you engage with them. It sounds like yeah. nothing is done without the partnership of others, most importantly, these growers. Absolutely. I mean, it, one of the things that Bill Coors said many years ago is that barley is to beer as grapes are to wine. It's just so important. So we have a better barley, better beer program. And, it, and again, what I love about it is that it often takes, you know, just one grower to make a difference. So quick example, we worked with the Stevensons um, to start a showcase barley farm. And what we did again more than a decade ago is start to put best management practices in so we could actually reduce the amount of water they were using on their farm. Again, nice success bringing in other growers. And now the program has grown that all 750 of our growers are part of our um, program, our Better Barley, Better Beer. We work with them to track and monitor and measure water usage, energy usage, greenhouse gas emissions, um, tillage, uh, fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus. 
And we actually have incentives that we pay them more to sustainably grow for us. Um, and it's a really great partnership that is uh, so important to us to get really high quality barley and still reduce the inputs and the impact, impact, there you go, or the imprint that we have on the environment. We should change it to our impact. <laughs> uh, Kim, when you were in law school at Madison, did you ever think you'd be an expert on tillage? <laughs> no, and uh, actually, I did. You know, growing up in Wisconsin, certainly farms are not foreign to yeah. me. But uh, walking through with whatever you call those gators or up and up your, to your thighs, because you're walking through farms and you have to be careful of stepping on snakes, is not something I thought I was going to sign up for. But I don't think anybody else in the beer industry, except that our agronomist team, um, probably signed up for that. <laughs> but, but climate change affects growers dramatically. Obviously, talk a little bit about. Uh, what you've seen and how you've seen it affect uh, growers, hops growers, barley growers. Um, it, it, uh, yeah. the, the, the farmers are the one of the early points of impact of climate change. Absolutely. I mean, it's so important. The barley is such a sensitive crop, so it can be really you know, um, impacted by long periods of drought or long periods of heat. Um, and so we need to really carefully monitor it. And just an example, one of the things that we've been doing for over 75 years is our own barley breeding program. And so it's not genetically modified, but we're able to produce a barley variety that actually can be more drought resistant or drought tolerant as well as heat tolerant. And what's been great is we've been um, so successful with the varieties that we've been able to introduce that they've also required less water and then in, in, in effect, less energy. So that's just an example of how we work really closely with the growers to um, provide them resources and help protect them from any you know, impacts of climate change down the line. And as you learn, as, as you learn more about the, how the beer business works, you, you know that these barley growers um, live and breathe your product. They are, they are incredibly proud and passionate about what they're doing to impact the final product for consumers. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's a great relationship. In fact, one of the uh, people that I follow the most on Twitter is uh, uh, Lucas. He's one of our growers and he's clever and he's funny and he's doing great things. And I just am so inspired when you see the tremendous work that our barley farmers are doing in their communities, on their crops, on their fields, and really making a gig gigantic difference um, for all of us. You talked to, let, let's switch gears a little, um, uh, you, you sort of back to packaging. We talked about packaging a little bit in terms of plastics earlier, but um, you, you obviously have a whole strategy around packaging. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what it is and how you think about uh, packaging as, as an impact on uh, climate change and, and just how it innovates over the years? Yeah, it's actually one of those areas that's a little bit tricky because you have to be careful. And I just want to, you know, give an example on the six pack plastic rings. So when you look at those, you know, they have very little carbon footprint. They're pretty lightweight and it's easy to transport beer. So when you as a company are making a decision to move to a different product like a fiber board, you have to look at what's going to be the impact on your greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time looking at reducing single use plastic. So it is a balancing and um, always meeting those needs head on is really important. Um, and then part of it too is what do consumers care about? Where do they want a company to go? How do they want to buy their beer? So we're always balancing the innovation, the technology across all of our goals and across all of our impact and making sure that we're getting consumers the product in the manner that they also want. So one of our uh, viewers, Todd, has a question around this, uh, this area, but I just want to uh, remind everybody that you can, uh, you can ask questions uh, through the chat function uh, if you're on uh, the webinar uh, uh, on the internet. And if you're on social media, Facebook, uh, you can leave questions in the comments and we'll, we're watching to retrieve them. So Todd asked a question along these lines. Uh, what sort of packaging will we start to see uh, soon that's more sustainable? You know, Todd, thanks for asking that because I didn't, Jim asked me the question, I didn't answer that. So one of the things that we've done already is we have taken our PET bottles, we've moved from a five layer to three layer, so it makes it a little easier to recycle. We're looking at more technology because in a beer bottle, you have a nylon layer. And so is there an opportunity for us to separate that nylon to make it even more recyclable? Um, we're certainly looking at alternatives to PET in that issue. But then on our plastic rings, we are the very first in North America to introduce 50% recycled content 
in our plastic rings in Canada. And we will be very soon introducing the 50% recycled content in our plastic rings in the US. And then we're also working at driving up the recycled content of any PET bottles. So um, all that innovation and, you know, we keep driving, there's a lot of activity happening in that space. Um, uh, you, you talked a lot about recycled content. Um, uh, that is a big piece of the change in the innovation that you see in so many different consumer products, uh, uh, consumer products, particularly, particularly beer, isn't it? Uh, th this idea of getting, it's not just about recycling, it's got to go to the next level with, the, with bringing it back into the product that it was in before. Absolutely. Yeah, it's super important, that whole circular economy and that circular mindset. You've talked, Kim, a lot about community, a lot about growers, uh, the Trinity Watershed uh, being a, almost a public-private partnership with federal, with USDA, with state and local communities uh, in it. Um, uh, you have a whole strategy around community investment. Could you could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's community, you know, beer is so local. We know everybody within our communities. We're part of the communities. We're part of that fabric. So making investments and impact there is so important. So we have a goal to make $100 million investments within our communities by 2025. We're currently at about $41 million has been invested. And then certainly in the times of 2020, we're really proud of the support and the investments that we've made in our Save Our Pubs programs with our bartenders and our wait staff and our, and our restaurants. Um, we've committed over a million dollars. And then to economic justice and our social justice and economic disparity and really helping um, African-American nonprofit groups, we've committed to over $1.5 million. So just a couple examples of many that I'd love to share with you, but making that investment and making a difference is really you know, just key to who we are as Molson Coors Beverage Company. And as you say, it's particularly important over the course, course of the last eight or nine months and for the next six months. Absolutely. And, you know, it's certainly keeping, you know, as we go into the winter months and as we really see the strain on our bars and our restaurants and our friends and our you know customers in that area, we're going to still be a the strong partner, if that stronger partner, because it's so integral to keeping, you know, the economy afloat and doing everything we can to support one another. You know, I'm sort of walking you through a little bit the, the production of, of beer, the the sale of beer, and now we're sort of to the end of the line where the beer has uh, been consumed and people have enjoyed it, and now we got to worry about where it goes. Uh, you talk about uh, the need to recycle to make the products uh, more, to make the packaging more recyclable, to make it more open to uh, being part of recycled content, um, and getting our products and keeping them out of the landfills are very important. You, you've got a whole strategy around this as well. We'd love to talk about that. Yeah, and it's not easy. I mean, if it was easy, the recycling rates would be higher. So we are part of a, a variety of collaborative groups, whether it be the Recycling Partnership in the U.S., the U.S. Plastic Pact, the Global Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, there are many of us across the food and beverage industry, consumer groups, recycling um, centers, and governments trying to work together to see how we can drive up recycling rates, improve the infrastructure so that um, products are actually getting recycled and continue that whole idea of a circular or economy or zero waste economy. So, so we want zero waste um, going into the landfill. So how's that work going? Uh, what are some of the hallmarks of, uh, of achievement so far? Yeah, so for us, just on a zero waste, just to make it personal about us, we're really thrilled about what we have been doing. Um, you know, when you look at the beer industry, it was important for us that we put our best foot forward. So we made a commitment that all 29 of our major breweries or any facility that has over 75 employees would be zero waste to landfill by 2025. We're already globally at 18 of 29. All of our U.S. Um, breweries are, have been included for quite some time. And that, you know, that's a great, just a mindset about, can we reduce the amount of waste we um, are actually producing? Can we reuse it or can we recycle it? You know, the uh, the merger with Molson wasn't that long ago. Um, and uh, John has a question here. How has the merger with Molson impacted your ability to act on a global level on, on some of these sustainability issues? Yeah, again, thanks, John, for that question. It's again about, you know, an opportunity. 
when we merged with Molson, with Molson, it's hard to say it's separated anymore, um, we became just a larger company. And so from our own standpoint, we thought we had a greater responsibility and we think our stakeholders thought we had even a greater responsibility. So we refreshed our targets and we set longer term targets and put even more stretch and raised the bar and what we were gonna commit to. Um, so it's actually created, I think, a, a better company, just even in the world of sustainability, but certainly all around, and makes us um, be able to do even greater um, feats and get and get more accomplished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, at the end of the day, beer is about the iconic brands that uh, that the, so many of the companies produce. You know, Miller, Molson, Coors. Uh, you 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 are all geniuses, sort of certainly in making beer, but in sort of marketing it as well. So I don't think we can really not talk about how brands fit in to so much of your work. Um, talk a little bit about how you integrate your iconic brands uh, into the work that you're doing and your colleagues are doing. Great. So I did say before I was going to be in this job for the long term, but if you guys can help me with that, if you can drink some more Coors Seltzer, that would definitely help me keep in this job for the long term. Um, but we have this great opportunity to work with our brands and help tell the story about sustainability. And when Coors Seltzer was developing their marketing campaign and talking about where they wanted to be, water is so important to that brand. And so we worked hand in hand to develop a program where we could talk about our efforts around water that have been longstanding and where we want to be in the future. So quite simply, for every 12 pack of Coors Seltzer you buy, Molson Coors will restore 500 gallons of water back to the watershed. So we've made a commitment already to 1 million gallons of water just in the next year and hoping that we sell more Coors Seltzer so that we can continue to um, restore even more across all the riverways and waters in the US and in Canada. Well, you've certainly you've certainly uh, hit on uh, a, a brand that's um, a brand and a product that's really flying off the shelves to increase uh, water restoration. I think we have a spot to show how this comes to life. <laughs> I don't know. Listen, I don't want to have this much fun, but the rivers need me. Do you think we want to sit around all day playing video games? No, but I'm doing it for the rivers. I'll lay here all day if I have to for the rivers. Giving this much hurts, but it's a small price to pay. We're not going to sit there and do nothing. We're going to sit here and do something. For, for the, the rivers. rivers. For, for the, the rivers. rivers. Drink a Coors Seltzer, help save a river. Each pack restores 500 gallons of river water. Well, certainly that's a great sacrifice, obviously. Um, <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> to be able to help the rivers. I think you also do this in, in uh, other other with other brands, I'm thinking of the Golden uh, EPA. Yeah, you know, um, actually, the the Golden um, Award that we received was from the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, but I can talk about that. But we also do it with other brands. For instance, our AC Golden and Colorado Native brand. What we've been able to do is work with them to actually eliminate the, the six pack plastic rings, and we put in a biodegradable fiber for that product. But the Golden EPA, if you don't mind, because I'm excited about it, I'd love to share this with you. Um, just, I think it was a week ago, or right before Thanksgiving, we, the, our Golden Brewery received a letter from the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and it was cool. It got sent to our CEO. And, and our CEO was so excited. He sent an email that said, what a great way to start the day. And then he forwarded it over to our team in the Golden Brewery. And the EPA recognized that brewery for their efforts, the EPA challenge. Um, I think traditionally, if you're able to reduce your energy usage by 10% in a five-year period, you qualify for this EPA challenge. And our Golden Brewery exceeded it. They actually, I just got it. They, it was 26% reduction in energy in a one-year period. So a great recognition from the EPA and for our brewery and for the efforts that they're doing. We we're really thrilled about that. And you really need that, right? You know, that recognition really helps. It motivates folks. It, it brings morale to, to the work you're doing to, to see the results and to see the, the sort of pat on the back from a important third party. It, it was really the cool thing about the letter, not to go on about it, but and what he did a nice job because they actually called out about three different individuals who single handed or who were uh, really responsible for driving that change. And so that recognition from a federal government to our CEO and then over to our brewery all in that letter makes a difference. It was really just a well appreciated and um, and definitely very motivating. And. Uh, not only that, but Golden is the um, 
is the crown jewel of, in many ways, of your system, isn't it really? The Golden Brewery, the Clear Creek, really important to um, who you are as a company. It is. I mean, it just speaks volumes. It's one of the largest breweries in the world. So when we can create great change, whether it's reducing our energy or reducing our water or producing fabulous high quality beer, it's so important to us. We're doing a, a, a multi hundred million dollar investment right now in that brewery because we're coming up on our 150th year of having that brewery in Golden. And so we're investing in that brewery to make it more efficient, to look at the brewing process and really continue to you know, invest millions and millions of dollars that will not only be better for producing great beer, um, but also having a better impact on the environment. And this is, you're right, this is where water efficiency comes in. Uh, uh, capital investment into these breweries can lead to greater efficiencies in so many different ways that help the environment. So that's that's a wonderful thing. I I don't I want to just stick on the Golden Brewery. We only have a couple minutes left, but I just want to stick on the Golden Brewery for a minute. You have a, a, a this sort of, sort of I'm just thinking about this um, uh, in particular as it uh, impacts our little uh, bar that we have here. We love it. I love it personally when uh, we have Colorado Native. You, you asked about, you, you mentioned Colorado Native a couple minutes ago, and I think it's actually a great example of how you can use a brand to, um, to build community. Could you, for the viewers on, who don't know what Colorado Native is, could you explain its uniqueness and how wonderful it is? Yeah, that's great. I do. I mean, it's, it is, it's such a special brand. So when you think about Colorado Native, it's just that every part of what goes into brewing that beer is native to the state of Colorado. So whether it be the hops or the barley or the water or the packaging, all of it is part of that, that entire brand. So it's a really special brand and one that we love and it's exciting to, when you get a chance to drink it. And, uh, and it tastes great. And we get it here as a special treat at the Beer Institute bar uh, uh, a few times a year. Um, uh, one of your, one of your great <laughs> colleagues uh, always provides it for us and it's always a treat. So um, Kim, I, 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 we're gonna sort of close out here. I wanna thank you for your time today. Uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful to talk to you. I just have one last question for you. Uh, uh -oh. your, daughter, your daughter's on the, um, as you said earlier, on the Marquette women's basketball team. What's the prospects for the Marquette women's team this year? Oh, you know what? I forgot to tell her to turn in, but even if I didn't tell her, um, they're going to be a great team. We, uh, again, we love Marquette basketball. So we've got UConn came into the Big East this year. So it's going to be exciting for the women to be playing UConn. We've got a great team in DePaul, really other fabulous competitors within the Big East. We're just excited to see them play. And uh, hopefully they end up Big East champions. And hopefully we have an NCAA tournament and we see them doing well, if, if not winning that tournament. Well, we can all sacrifice with a beer for the environment uh, during um, during uh, uh, March Madness. It might be May Madness this year. Not really sure. <laughs> That's okay. Kimarata. We'll take it. <laughs> Tim Murata, Senior Director of Sustainability and Enterprise Risk Management at Molson Coors. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for the work you do. Um, and we hope uh, you all, uh, viewers, got a chance to uh, know another beer employee a little bit better. So Kim, thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. Yeah. Cheers. Happy holidays. And thank you to all uh, the viewers. Um, we're going to be back with this series uh, in another couple of months uh, with some more You Want to Know a Beer Industry Employee Spotlight. So thanks all. Cheers. Cheers, Kim. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.